Some years ago, I went to see Frozen 2 with my extended family. And, much to my surprise, it's pretty good. Excellent, even. The music is awesome, there's some good writing, jokes land, the characters are well realized, the plot is there. All in all, I do have some honest to god good time with it. About two thirds into the movie, Elsa reaches her climax. <gasps> About two thirds into the movie, Elsa's character arc reaches its climax. After much tribulation, she reaches the mythical island of Ahtohalla, the MacGuffin of the plot. And as this is a Disney movie, we are carried there through a song, a heartfelt power ballad. Me and my daughter change glances. She's smiling, as am I. It's a damn fine song. Every hair of my body is erected. Shivers run through me. My breath feels shallow. My palms sweaty. I'm no longer in charge of my facial muscles. Smiling seems to have become involuntary. Somewhere around the first chorus, tears fill my eyes. I don't notice them. I just sit and watch. It's a damn fine song. The scene reaches its climax. The music, the story, Elsa. Everything soars, ascends. Me alongside them. The final chorus arrives and something within me snaps. I've always had a obsession with originality. Everything had to be unseen, unheard of, bored and new horizons. A new side of a coin. Uniqueness was a laudable qualia, regardless of quality or utility. Not something to strive for, but the thing to strive for. Has this been done before? Is this original enough? Does this shed new light or bring a new angle into something already established? Or even better, is this something unheard of, unorthodox, way outside the box? These are the kinds of ideas that rose up when I thought of creation, the meandering thoughts that guided my hands. Not honesty, integrity, not meaning or substance, not quality nor technical prowess. Success, popularity, all the same. All I cared for was originality. But the problem, nothing is ever original enough. So that's what I did, day in, day out, nothing. I kept all the unoriginal ideas inside me, hidden from the world. I watched with scorn as others wrote, composed, created, and bled out their heart's blood. They found success a way forward. The world rewarded them with prosperity amongst their silly, non-original pieces. But my creativity was a blank slate, an endless vista of imagination and opportunity, unsullied by trite and derivative ideas. This status quo held as long as I didn't do anything stupid, like something, instead of nothing. Of course, this all is a defense mechanism. I'm timid, petrified to face the notion there might not be anything unique about me. That I am a human equivalent of a B- exam. A solid 7 out of 10. I'm talented, but no one's going to write any books about me. I'm smart, but not brilliant. I'm gifted, but not exceptionally so. I'm strong and capable, but not so you could speak about physical prowess. I'm liked and socially adapt, but not revered, nor charismatic. To quote Douglas Adams, I'm mostly harmless.
I've always worked on supportive roles, helped others to shine. And while there is genuine fulfillment to be found there, I always carried with me this aura of martyrdom. Since I spend my limited time on this earth to help others instead of furthering my own ambitions, I should be qualified for a few bonus points on the cosmic scoreboard. My actions to further these ambitions have been pretty much non-existent. If I did something of my own, I did it in a kind of detached way. Played it off as a joke, some sort of thinly veiled message to no one in particular. Everything was always instrumental. I never really contended with anything, never wrestled with my ambitions. There was no genuine heart behind anything. Or if there was, it was veiled, wrapped in this detached facade. It's easier that way. If you admit to yourself or others that you want, need things, well, that's just utterly horrifying. We've just created a fail state, a clear definition for lack. It's easier to play detached and untouchable. Plus, yearning for success, attention and fulfillment is so unoriginal. I forged this well-fortified battalion of reasons why I'm not where I want to be in my life. This facade is built around few key axioms. First, I'm too deep and enlightened of a person to be beckoned by success and attention. Second, even if I were, the game is obviously rigged, proven by the success of all the unoriginal people. Third, people have bad taste, as proven by the fact I remain unsuccessful and other clearly non-deserving people don't. So, all in all, it's quite clear that one shouldn't publish or release anything, if they have even a shred of decency. If the game is crooked, it's a despicable act to join in, even if just for a couple of rounds. As long as you hold on to the stance the game itself is stupid, there's no reason to partake in it. As long as I am not a part of the game, I can hold on to the thought that given the chance, I'd be exceptional in it. It's not that I'm frozen by my lack of courage. I'm just seeking something more. Something better. Something the hoi polloi couldn't even understand. It's effortless to fashion rationalizations like these. Whip up principles to cover your own insecurities. So effortless you might start to believe your own thoughts. When it comes to rationalizations, the more muddled and abstract, the better. Originality is a mighty one indeed. It's vague, yet so obviously meaningful. When you keep the waters muddled, they can, in fact, appear deep. All my favorite songs share one aspect. They give me this eerie feeling, like I've always known them. This song, this story, this sequence of sounds and words has always been a part of me. It's like a homecoming, a return to something. This isn't nostalgia. These songs don't take me back to some bygone age when days were brighter and I a little less darker. I have a very troubled relationship with the past in general. There's nothing I long to return to. Whatever it is I feel, 
it's not nostalgia, but rather a sort of belonging. Which takes us back to Frozen 2. What made this scene so special? Why did it hit so hard? Well, it is a damn fine song. It's a power ballad, a catchy lifter, an orchestral juggernaut. It braids together musical motifs, plot points, visual cues and narrative themes littered throughout the movie. It feels like a homecoming in every way. This is the true climax of the movie, of Elsa's arc. The last third is just to tie up loose ends, to unearth the questions that still lay unanswered. It all just comes together here, and it feels like home. E minor, C, D, G. This isn't just goosebumps, it's something else, something akin to magic, a damn fine song. But this scene isn't magical. It has passed through dozens if not hundreds of hands. Animators, musicians, voice actors, producers, programmers, screenwriters, directors. And of course, probably a dozen runs through boards of bigwigs and audience test screenings to sand off all the wrinkles. The folks at Modern Disney are renowned for their unlove of jagged edges. If there ever was a sort of grand artistic vision hidden somewhere within this movie, surely it's been mangled into oblivion by now. It's a trick. Smoke and mirrors. Manufactured with the utmost craftsmanship, yes. But still, just a trick. Everything seems powerful when it's projected to a huge screen. Every word feels profound when it's delivered on a bed of evocative music and a choice use of narrative pacing. That's pretty much all I do on this channel. Manipulate the audience through skilled use of rhetoric, allusion and drama. That's not magic. That's like cheating, right? You play the game on cheat codes. This sort of cynicism is like a second nature to me. I'm always ready and armed against the tricks these artists, these jokers and charlatans try to pull. I take pride in the notion I see through their gimmicks. Grand shots, bombastic scores, dramatic scenes, well-chosen words, intricate choreographies, striking visuals. It'll require more to get past my shield. This 101 of cheese might fool most people, but I'm not part of that crowd. In the end, this is just a simple song, and a quite cheesy one at that. Cliched enough to feel familiar, vague as to seem universal. But all this doesn't make this song any less of a Miracle. It could have been any other song, another story and nothing. The world goes on, 8 out of 10. But it wasn't. It was this song, this story, at that exact moment. And the world can never be the same. So, what was it I figured out? What came over me? Well, maybe I figured out the meaning of life.
What if all this excess, be it a big screen, evocative music, all the smoke and mirrors artists bamboozle us with, what if we need all that? What if that is the little sprinkle of wanderlust we need to lose ourselves into a moment? A little misdirection, so you forget the complex dance you've practiced all your life. Your carefully curated person suit. And instead you just are and wander in awe. What if instead of a trick, it's a ritual? I've come to believe art is first and foremost a physical medium. It's an altogether different experience to see a photograph of Michelangelo's David than to stand in its shadow, see it tower before you. The former can be nice, I guess, but the latter can change your life. But you already know this, everybody knows this though it sometimes feels like we're kind of trying to forget. There's ample reason to choose practicality over excess. That's the right term, I guess. Money, time, convenience. You have to go outside. Out. That's where the other people live. There are lines, crowds, God. Better to save your money and sanity and just stay inside. Plus, it's nice to have an endless feed of content at your fingertips at all times. Limitless amounts of options to shuffle through once you get bored. But I'm not so sure about that either. When was the last time you opened YouTube, Instagram, TikTok and felt truly blessed to have all this content available? Do the endless feeds, lists and options fill you with gratitude and bliss? Perhaps there's a hidden cost for convenience. There's something to be said about rituals, of viewing life as a landscape of rituals. They demand your attention, your submission. The thing starts when it starts, every spring, full moon, Sunday, New Year's Eve. You have to be there. There's no weather checking the full moon. The dying crops don't really care whether this Thursday works for you. There are rules, a proper way of conduct. You wash yourself of impurities, dress up, show effort, humility. Often a sacrifice is required, at least of time and effort, but maybe even something of more value. Food, wealth, a pound of flesh. This isn't about you, per se. You get to participate, partake in something grander than yourself. This ritual, this moment, is beyond you. Maybe we could do with more things that are beyond us these days. Perhaps we need them to stay sane. Moments that demand you to just shut up and marvel in awe of the things more grand and beautiful than Whatever it is you think you do when you scroll through your phone for the 37th time that day. We don't have those kinds of rituals anymore. Ones that demand. What we have are convenient commodities. White bread for the soul. It fills you up, but doesn't satiate. Okay, that's not entirely true. 
We do have rituals. We are surrounded by them every day. We just tend not to recognize them anymore. We don't look low enough. An enthralled crowd, 100,000 watts of bass drum fills the sky. It shakes the ground, your body. Everything beats, pulsates, resonates. You sit in a darkened room with hundreds of other people. You stay into the gargantuan screen before you. The drama unfolds. Everyone is quiet. The whole stadium waits with bated breath as the athlete prepares, then lunges forward. They twist, turn, contort, fly through the air. You could hear a pin drop. The athlete sticks the landing, just barely, but they do. The actor says the right words, the artist plays just the right notes. The crowd erupts, roars, the music soars. Everybody raises their hands to the heavens. Everyone's elated. Hugs, kisses, tears. For a brief moment everything makes sense. All is right in the world. Your whole being is so goddamn filled with meaning. You can hardly stand it. Then the curtain drops. Lights turn back on. The narrator is quiet. The fat lady sings no more. A spell is broken and we remember what the world is like, how things are, who we are, or at least pretend to be. We resume our composure and leave. It was all a parlor trick, smoke and mirrors and some good old craftsmanship. But what if it wasn't, you know? We've told tales and stories to each other for thousands of years, before there was a written language. We've danced, painted and sang to each other even longer, perhaps even before we could speak to one another. Before language, before knowledge, there was drama, there was art, and there was awe. Perhaps those are the most primordial forms of human expression. The ones that speak to our very being. What if these rituals don't help us forget, but to remember what we can be like when we discard our well-curated person suits for a moment? What the world could be should we leave behind everything that makes us so inadequate? What if it's not an escape, but a homecoming, a return to something more real? These days we tend to find the idea of rituals as primitive, and the people who partook in them were clearly simpletons, an attribute we civilized folk aspire very much not to be. What else could that kind of magical thinking attest to? And that's fair, I guess. I too believe in science, reason, cause and effect. But magic is a funny term. Because if by magic we mean that a very specific sequence of steps will produce rain, or a certain incantation can help you cast a level 15 pyromancy, then yeah, I guess I don't believe in magic either. But if we define magic as to transform the perceived world through the use of words, sounds and images. Now we're getting somewhere. And thus I have to redact something I said earlier, when I claimed this scene wasn't magical. It is 4 minutes and 32 seconds of world transforming sounds, words and images. But even more than magic, this scene is true. At least my body, my being, thinks so. I've stood before coffins without one tear shed, 
but this cheesy song hits me in the gut every time. I waded through loss, sickness, disappointments and betrayal without batting an eye, but I've never managed to watch this scene without tearing up. There's something in this scene more real than death, sickness or even time and space. It's more real than reality. It's true the same way numbers are true. Even years later, I can't really articulate what this scene helped me realize, but I do know what it helped me let go of. Every ounce of cynicism bled out of my body, <laughs> and boy oh boy, was there a lot of that stuff to bleed out. It felt as if for the first time I contended with the experience of goosebumps in a serious manner. I admitted to myself this sensation might not be just a trick. A neurological tick talented professionals can manipulate for Gloria Mundi. Instead, this thing might be important. It might just be the most important thing there is. It no longer mattered to me what made this song so special. I just didn't care. And not in a I don't give a damn sense. There's still taste, talent, the craft. Those things are not gone. But for the first time I valued lineage. Yeah, let's use that word. Instead of uniqueness, I saw connection. Where there were cliches, I found universal. I traded novelty for congruence. I let go of what was unique to receive what was authentic. Instead of a unique story, I witnessed the very human effort to articulate something unfathomable. It fails, of course. A song, a story, a video can only provide glimmers. But a glimmer is hell of a lot more than nothing, isn't it? How do you speak of things so grand? There were no words around when they came to be. Maybe that's why we still dance, sing, paint pictures and tell stories. Because we have no adequate words to tell what it feels like to be, to struggle, to overcome and to find home. So I kind of saw all that play out while Elsa sang her song. We both found home. And I realized I'd heard this song a thousand times, this story a thousand more. That's how I knew it was a good one. And all I wanted to do was sing songs of that one song and tell tales of that one story. Come my darling, homeward bound. I am found. Goddamn. It's easy to become cynical in this current zeitgeist, where every day feels like we're about to drown in white noise. Everybody wants our attention. We want everybody's attention. Stories, art, text, entertainment, music, videos, games are produced for, well, content. What a sad word. Such a vile, monstrous term. Content. We are like infants in front of a mobile and someone dangles a shiny object in front of us. The dangler and us, locked in a sort of parasitic relationship. 
The simple act of attention grants life force to the dangler. A reason to remain. Our unflinching stare can dispel the monumental horror of existence. But the sad truth is, we need each other. We, the ones who stare, are just as much parasites as the ones who dangle. We are both adrift on a great, vast sea. As long as no one flinches, the void and its horrors stand at bay. If we all hold our breath and don't break eye contact, the cable won't snap and we won't fall into the depths, the abyss where the monsters wait. Amidst these kinds of thoughts, it's easy to take a resentful stance towards creators, artists, storytellers and stories. If you really commit to the part like yours truly, you can even learn to resent people. Just let cynicism take a good chokehold of your soul and run rampant with it. All this content we create, nothing more than an extension of the rampant attention economy. Paintings, books, videos, games, music, theater, poetry, mass entertainment, hot takes, blogs, tweets, penny dreadfuls and extra extra read all about it. Everything becomes a piece of a larger whole. A shameful instrumental cog in the great quest for capital. Be it monetary or attention. A desperate cry of a mob, billion strong. The problem... We live for our stories and off stories. We are ready to die and deal death for them. We are all storytellers, weavers of dreams. We often comprehend our lives as if a story, a part of a larger narrative. The next chapter, a new beginning, closure, comedy, tragedy, the end. Main character, NPC, villain. So what's your story? We ask one another. We all recognize a good story, an awe-inspiring experience, when we happen upon one. They seldom are something outside our fields of experience, a new side of a coin. No, we recognize a good story, because we've heard it before. The characters change, the plots differ, time plays an aesthetic shift with the eons, but the story remains the same, the resonance remains. And so, maybe the notion is something original is flawed in all kinds of ways. Perhaps I've had this thing wrong my whole life. Maybe that which we pass forward doesn't have to be about us. My creations aren't merchandise with which I barter myself the right to exist, with which brilliance I buy myself some existential peace. A right to maybe even, God willing, enjoy my life a bit. Free from constant guilt and shudder. That'd be nice, you know? These things, pieces of the creative spirit manifested, whatever this is I'm up to, they are from me, but they are not me. They're just something. Something I put out into this world. Perhaps it's not necessary to change the world, to change the way we consume content. Maybe it's not imperative to create things so deep and original they repair. Well, whatever you deem in need of repair. A small, twist-like motion, deep inside, half a degree's turn in one's worldview. Maybe that's all that's needed to change the world. 
you tilt your head slightly, squint your eyes just a little, and the whole world is a different place. Perhaps even a better one. We can view the content we create and consume as a glittering bait. Something we obtrude each other with in this limitless void we inhabit. An endless sea, a blinding glimmer of a million baits. Everyone hopes someone, anyone, would hearken to us. Take notice and stop, if even just for a small moment. They would admire our creations, notice the ways our works are both unique and deviant. Someone would caress our cheek, say kind words, pat us on the crown of our head and confirm we are indeed a good boy. They vanish to carry on their own journey through the glittering infinity. But perhaps our creations don't have to be glittering baits for others to gawk at. Smoke and mirrors, elaborate parlor tricks, something used and discarded with ease. Maybe they can be an ember, a candle in the dark, a bonfire for humanity. Something which mere existence is enough to keep the horrors at bay. Something by which glimmer others may rest and regroup, by which warmth they can gather their resolve before they carry on their own journeys as we all inevitably must do. Maybe to do so answers the most profound of all questions. To create light and pass it on, never take care whether it is us who get to bathe in the humble glimmer we pass forward. We seem to value originality most when it enriches something we are familiar with when it shines a new light to which we already deem important and valuable. We recognize a good story because we've heard it before. <laughs>